Welcome to Unleash Your Supernova Live. I'm your host, Nova Lorraine, and the author of Unleash Your Supernova, available at your favorite bookstores. I'm also a mother of four, the founder of Rain Magazine, Pink Kangaroo, the Rain School of Fashion, and Nova Lorraine International. I'm here with one of my favorite people in the world, my co-host, Ryan Anderson, founder of Rain of <laughs> not Rain, founder of Ryan Esquire, a business and peak performance coaching and consulting company. He'll be joining me as my partner in crime as we help you unleash your supernova. If you end up liking Ryan as much as I do, you can get more by checking out RyanEsquire.com. That's Ryan with an O, R-Y-O-N, Esquire.com. Join the fun live every Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern as we help you increase creativity, beat burnout, and happily survive the roller coaster of creative entrepreneurship. This is a companion show to the book, Unleash Your Supernova, your go-to guide for immediately usable tips on mindset, creativity hacks, decreasing stress, and unlocking your limitless potential. If you miss us on Fridays on BBS Radio, no problem. Make sure to download and subscribe to the Unleash Your Supernova podcast. Hey, Ryan. How's it going, Nova? I'm good. I'm good. You know, I'm I'm working through these new headphones I have, and not sure if I'm mm-hmm. loving them just yet. <laughs> really? But what? I'm giving them a try. Yeah? What are you not liking about them just yet? Well, you know what? I typically use headphones that are wired to my device, yeah. and so this is yeah. uh, Bluetooth, and it's, you know, like any new device, it takes a minute, you know, to get used to it, so I'm just going yeah. through that learning curve right now. So, so you're one of those people that really hated the day when uh, those old old school like telephones went from like wired in the wall to like wireless handsets. You just like you just like being physically connected to something, don't you? That's what it sounds like. <laughs> well, you know, I'm old school. I'm old school. I yeah, it's kind of what I'm gathering. Yeah, I, I I'm I'm old school because I'm I'm one of those that are you know paranoid about health. And um, so I wasn't a big fan on the Bluetooth because it's so close to my head. You know what I'm saying? I gotta protect. Yeah, I gotta yeah, protect what's yeah, in for the brain cancer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but you know, there's definitely advantages to going wireless. So I'm I'm trying it out. Yeah. Yeah, but it's funny that you mentioned that. My dad just got his first set of hearing aids. And I don't know how much you know about hearing aids, but like they are not, you know, old school hearing aids that you saw 10 or 15 years ago. Um, it's essentially like having a really expensive pair of Bluetooth headphones because they Bluetooth into his phone, oh. right? And uh, yeah, it's super cool because not only, I mean, because it's so weird. He went from like yelling and screaming into the phone when you call him now. He's, I mean, old, not quite whispering because Anderson, man, just our voices carry, but. Um, it's so much quieter. Yeah, it's crazy. And and but the problem with it is, is I don't know why he does this. He gets wandering around the house without his phone, and he goes at a Bluetooth range. So like, I go from conversations like, it, 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 and I'm like, Dad, get closer to your phone. And it, he just he turned into like wandering old man now that just walks around <laughs> talking to people. Like they said, gets too far from his phone, but. Um, you know, it's, it's made a huge difference in his quality of life from the standpoint of um, okay. just being involved in conversations, you know, because he can hear so much better now. But, um, but yeah, but that that's his Bluetooth issue is he wanders too far from his phone. Mm. So, yeah, yeah. Well, Probably you know, modern I, technology, huh? Modern technology. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's definitely this love-hate relationship with tech that yeah. I have. I, I'm actually a big nerd. I'm I research like new stuff that's coming out and I do like trying new things, but yeah, there's a part of me that's that country girl that, you know, likes to, you know, stay grounded, you know, just snuggle up with a blanket and a book and I'm good. But then there's the other side of me that's that city girl that needs to have like the latest and the greatest. So there's definitely, I do have a love, <laughs> A love hate relationship and you know these like like internal uh um fights sometimes but okay well we know the techie side the city girl one today 
But um, I wanted to talk to you about a newsletter that I put together recently. And over the emails, I like sending out personal emails, not really like a newsletter, you know, what's happening, what, you know, an update. But um, the topic that I shared today was about value and providing value in what you do. Hey, Ryan. How's it going, Nova? I'm good. I'm good. You know, I was thinking about trying these new headphones that I just got for our show, yeah. but um, I decided to put them to the side. They didn't quite work out the way I was expecting. Did you go back to the old ones? Did you really? I did. I did. <laughs> you are. You, you are OG. You, are, you, you, you do like being wired in, don't you? <laughs> I don't know if I like being wired in, but... I I'm know. anal about quality, and until I could figure out, you know, why my Bluetooth isn't on? working the way yeah. I want, I'm I'm just going old school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, trust me, I understand. I'm the same way uh, about quality. Uh, um, I, I I'm 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 actually real anal about it too. But um, and, and it, but I'm also like, you know, I'm gonna try I'm gonna try my damn just to figure out how to do it with the new, newest piece of technology. And until I, I, it absolutely proves me that it's not going to be as good as the old stuff, and then I'll go back. Well, but. you're gonna might have to help me figure out this new piece because <laughs> it's about to go back. It is about to go is back, it? but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we will we'll have to set up a time where I could test them for one of our conversations. That's not yeah. during the live yeah. show, but um, I wanted to just. This is still on my mind. I, I wrote this this morning, and I was sending out an email, and uh, it was about value. And I wanted to mm -hmm. share a story on the new ABC feature that I had gotten, and super excited about it. It was done by a great producer, Valerie, Valerie Pritchett with ABC 27. Mm -hmm. And when I thought back to how we connected and how the interview came about, I was like, wait a minute, this is really about providing value. And so I'm just going to give mm -hmm. you the story. So I was at a coffee shop, and this cute little local family-owned coffee shop. This was pre-COVID. And I, you know, I had my workout gear. I just ran in and to get matcha. I actually get matcha when I'm there. And they're one of the few uh, places yeah. that make matcha without sugar. So, yeah, and I am okay. one of those that drinks matcha tea without sugar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not mm -hmm. as, oh, gee, not you're OG, you're a you're a purist, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, so I was there, and I was waiting for my matcha, and, and I see this you know, person come in and a cameraman behind her, and I was like, oh, don't come this way, don't come this way. <laughs> and so she said, excuse me, I'm doing, you know, I'm you know, going around asking questions by individuals that live locally about X, Y, Z, whatever the topic was. Yeah. And would you be interested in, in, in answering the questions for the camera? And I was like, uh, I'm like in my workout clothes. I have no makeup on. I don't even know what my hair looks like. She's like, oh, you look fine. And in my head, I'm thinking, no, I'm literally <laughs> yeah. not made up at all. And I was like, you know what? Who cares? So I answered her questions. She was really grateful. She gave me her card and she's like, oh, check it out. It'll be on the news at this time. I said, okay, fine. <laughs> And um, so I just a few months later, she came to mind about something. I just said, hey, I just want to, you know, um, check in if there's anything I can do to help any, you know, any ideas that you need for anything, just let me know. And and we stayed in touch. And a few months ago, mm -hmm. um, I knew my book was coming out and I wanted to, you know, I was brainstorming ways where I can get get more visibility about the book launch. And I thought of Valerie. And so we had exchanged communication and I said, you know what? I'm going to ask her if she would consider me to, you know, as a feature for Black History Month. Because as far as I'm right. concerned, yep. I'm doing a lot of different things that I feel like mm -hmm. going down in history. You know, the first to create a publication specifically for creative entrepreneurs. And most recently, mm -hmm. the Pink Kangaroo Network being the first to do yep. a podcast network for creatives, let alone being a woman doing it and women of color. And mm -hmm. soon to be the first creating the only podcast educational platform focusing on innovation and sustainability. And so I said, like, you know what? And I got a book coming out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so I, I You're kind of an interesting her person. And, yeah. Yeah. and, you know, and she said, well, send me your, your accomplishments, you know, send me the things that you, you want to share. And I did anyway, long story short, 
the feature ran a few days ago, and I'm really excited about it. But it was about, you know, providing value to someone when they needed it, staying in touch and offering more value without asking for anything in return. And then when I needed something that was truly authentic, you know, it wasn't like, oh, pitch me for this, and I was not a good fit. I made sure that I delivered and went over above with what she was asking for. And, and it turned into an ABC news feature. So, but it started with value. And I just think that's something that's really important to, you know, to share. You know, it really is. And it's, it's one of those things that uh, it's so hard for people to get their head around because, you know, it, Providing value is really about giving without expectation of receiving, right? And um, so many people kind of live their life quid pro quo, right? Like, you know, I do this for you, you do this for me, and and um, I guess that can work, but but it 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 really takes uh, not only a shift in mindset, I think, but but really faith that you know by providing value, it will not only come back to you, but come back to you tenfold, and it may not come back directly from the person you provided value from, but it could be, you know, maybe they gave your name to somebody, right? You know, maybe, like I said, like you with your ABC um, spot and someone sees um, you, you spot the news and bec- that becomes, you know, a new client or, or another connection. or whatever. And so it, it, I agree with you. It's one of the things that is like super, super important for not only success in business, but really just personal happiness, right? So it's all about being a good person in many ways. But um, it, it really does take a leap of faith that I think most people are frankly uncomfortable with. And um, but it's, it, it's just it's kind of the way the universe works. I agree. I agree. I mean, in the book, I do dedicate some space in talking about giving and how important it is to give before you receive. And right. you know, I do clubhouse rooms, and you know, I feel that. The ones that I've been in and the ones that I like mm-hmm. to deliver are the ones that are really focused on sharing value to the listeners, to the individuals that are in the room, coming with a true intent of helping someone with something. Yeah. And it does yeah. really feel good. I mean, it does. When you go into a situation without expecting anything and you're there to be of service, it does feel good when that person is you know, being helped in some way. And, mm-hmm. but I've seen going back to, you, you know, your point about this is how the universe works. What I've seen is that, 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 that comes right back to you. The river flows back in your direction when you least expect it. And, right. but at the same time, in that immediate moment, when you're delivering that value, when you are being of service and you're giving without the intent of receiving, like, oh, I'm only going to do this because I want something right away, mm-hmm. you know, like you were saying then um, you also get that feel good in that moment. So at the end of the day, regardless if that turns into something directly, you know, for you or indirectly for you, you still got the benefit of how it feels when you do, you know, help someone. So, yeah, anyway, I just thought that was something to bring up. It's still fresh in my mind, you know, when I sent out um, the email about the feature and how it really just started with, yeah, I had to step out of my comfort zone, being on camera and knowing I literally was just running in to get matcha and my, who knows what my hair was doing. I had no makeup on. I was in, you know, a tank top and spandex pants. You know what I'm saying? I was like, oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> so here's the real question. And, Did you watch But that I knew I was helping her. You you know? I was like, okay, whatever, you yeah. know. And, um, but then also following up and, again, being of service. So I just think that's so important for us to remember. I mean, who knows, maybe it'll lead to someone else's spot on TV or again, just that feel good moment. But I think it's something to at least recognize as part of the process of unleashing your greatest self, unleashing that inner brilliance, you know, by you helping someone else, you're tapping into their greatness. You're helping them with their potential which then mm-hmm. flows back to you. So that was the point that I wanted to make. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a super powerful point. So what do you want to talk Here's about today? Quick. So today I say we flip the tables and because your book is being released next week, right? Is it, what, what, what day is your book being released? 
for everybody to know. March 16th. March super 16th. Super exciting. Write it down, everyone. Yeah. Uh, I said super exciting, right? Yes. I am I'm excited and nervous at the same time. I don't know if those two of go course. together, right? They do go together. Yeah. <laughs> I'm feeling it, like I'm feeling both at the same time. But uh, so today, I want to interview you. Today's show is going to be all about you, and I, I, I'm, I'm a huge why guy. I love to know why people do what they do, make the choices they make, right? Believe the way they believe, right? So my first question to you is, like, essentially, why did you write this book? What made you decide that not only did you want to, like, you know reveal yourself and put it in like written format for like the world to see but like this the time was right now as well so it's all yours that's a really no that's a really good question and thanks for flipping the tables Mm -hmm. (laughs) um so you know i i was in publishing as you know and still in publishing with Mm -hmm. rain magazine this is our 14th year and there's been opportunities for me to write and be published in rain. And actually when I, the first few issues, I was the one of the only writers um, for the magazine. So I never really set out to be an author and it wasn't something that had been on my mind for decades or anything like that. It was very organic. I Mm -hmm. love telling stories, as you know, and Mm -hmm. I would share stories of different experiences I would have or I had on my journey and with whoever would hear them to help them with a particular situation. And then Mm -hmm. immediately after sharing the story and the principle, they would say, Oh, you should write a book. You should put, you should put that Mm -hmm. in a book. And I sort of like blew it off the first few times I heard that. And it was a good friend of mine um, who really made it stick. He, you know, he started with rain as an intern and became the senior editor at the magazine over time. And we were talking and I shared another story. And then he said, you should put in a book. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, no, I'm serious. (laughs) You need to Mm -hmm. put your stories in the book for years. I've been hearing you share your stories. And there's so many people that can benefit from what I'm hearing right now. And then it just, that just stuck with, stuck with me, even though I heard the comments, you know, a few times before and then mm-hmm. I said, hmm, you know, you know, there are people, so many people that could benefit from this story, this one particular story that I was sharing. And, and you know, maybe I should seriously consider putting in a book. And writing and publishing a book is completely different than writing for a magazine and publishing a magazine, really? at least, you know, fashion magazine. And so it wasn't yeah. a space that I felt 100% comfortable stepping into. And so... I decided that I was going to hone my skills as a writer. I mean, I felt confident mm-hmm. enough as a writer to to seriously consider writing a book, but I would say the inspiration really came from knowing that I could benefit so many more people through a book than just one-on-one storytelling that I was doing at that time. Yeah. That's super interesting. Um and there's like so much to unpack there. So, um, you you said like like I, I'm surprised, you know, considering that you publish a magazine that that you were essentially uncomfortable in in kind of publishing the book, right? Because I I was surprised that they were very very different in the way that they were done. So, you know, um, what really kind of allowed you to push past that uncomfortableness? And, and delve into like writing the book because like it's not easy from what I hear. <laughs> it's a, it's a daunting process from what I hear. So like, what allowed you to do that? Yeah, the process is extremely daunting because it's where do I start? That's you know, for I know a lot of writers, where do I start? I have this great idea, and just getting through you know chapter one through three, I think, could be the most difficult for for most. And I didn't actually, I had the idea, I was committed to, you know, the thought of doing this, but Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure yet if I was going to publish it myself because I'm in publishing or if I wanted to go through another publisher. I didn't know if this was something that was going to be chronological and I'm just starting with, you know, when I was 
a kid and, and ending with where I am now, I mm-hmm. had no idea which stories I was going to include. I mean, there were definitely some standout ones that I could laugh about or still cry about. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was very daunting. And I think for me, when I had a very basic outline mm-hmm. of the concepts, like at least the lessons I wanted to share, the lessons I learned, that was for me the starting point. And so I know writers work in different ways. Some use, you know, sticky notes, some use index cards, some use outlines. For me, it was an outline that helped me um, know the lessons I wanted to share and sort of guided me from there to the stories that I wanted to, you know, tell around those lessons. And I initially thought it was going to be chronological, but it, it didn't turn out to be. It was mm-hmm. what was most important to share and finding the story that related back to that information and knowledge that I wanted to um, get out there. So one And then thing another that, point that, too, Ryan, that I wanted, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, another point that I wanted to bring up sure. about that challenge of going from, mm-hmm. you know, a magazine editor, publisher to writer especially when sharing your stories, your own personal stories, it's, you're being very raw. You know, you're like peeling the onion, you're peeling the banana. And it is, I've found, especially when communicating with other writers, that's a very vulnerable space to be in. So you really, really do have to want to step out of that comfort zone, step out of that shell to put yourself out there. You know, yeah. and because the criticism could come around your writing or the criticism criticism could come around your experiences, your successes, yeah. your failures. You know, mine is a nonfiction, even though I do write fiction. This is a nonfiction. And yeah. so there's a lot of room for judgment. And so you have to be OK with being in that space where you could be judged good or bad. And so I do get, you know, that point that you made or, or you know, bring that point back you know, in, in light where it was a challenge for me to commit to writing a book, even though I was already writing for a magazine or, or editing and publishing for a magazine. Yeah. Yeah. You know, cause people tell me the same thing you do like, like, cause my, apparently my story is inspiring or interesting. So tell me all the, all the time, you know, you should write a book. And, and that's actually been kind of one of my secret reasons for not wanting to as well is, is, is it is so raw and so vulnerable and you're so exposed. And in many ways, you're exposed in a, on a platform that you can't defend yourself because they're reading mm. the book, you're not there, and they're evaluating what you have to say. And you're, like you said, your thoughts, your ideas, your beliefs, and the way you write it. And there's no way that you can, like, you know, defend your choices or, or, or defend your actions or whatever. And, and that's a super vulnerable place for people like you and me who, who really kind of like to, you know, control their reality, right? And so... um that's again. That's kind of one of the reasons why I've never done it. So I, I totally commend you for 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 you know stepping into that fear and conquering it because it's not an easy thing to do. Um, but well, I will want encourage to encourage you to definitely do it. You definitely need. I to do probably it. will at some. I'm I'm taking my first step. I'm writing a chapter, which is not a chapter. I'm writing a chapter for someone else's book. That's not. It doesn't involve my story, but it's definitely involving my ideas. So. It's a little bit safer. It's, it's a nice little, like, you know, dipping the toe in the water type thing. But um, I probably will wrap my own book at some point in time. It's just I haven't fully wrapped my head around that commitment yet. Because it, it, it is such a daunting thing that, you know, especially when you know people who have done it. Like, you know, because I'm not fully ignorant of the process now. That's kind of like, I'm going to, like, really work up the mental mental. Like we said last week, I've got to work up the uh, what, what was it? intestinal fortitude to, to, <laughs> to, to, to want right. to put the time, effort, and energy <laughs> into it, right? So, but one of the things that you mentioned when you were talking about it is that stuck out to me was the process of it, right? And, and the process of thinking about your accomplishments, thinking about your ideas, thinking about your successes and failures, and, and what what you really wanted to put into that book. So my question for you is. What did you learn about yourself through the process of, you know, outlining, planning, and writing this book? Good or bad, Ooh. by the way. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's a that there's you know a lot of. I mean, I'm I guess, all about um, good, deep, difficult <laughs> questions, Nova. That's the way I roll. There's a lot of layers to that 
question. Um, yeah, I'm I would an say, <laughs> I would say I definitely learned that the more you write, the better you get. I mean, it's just, it's yeah. literally like a muscle. It's like running. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like learning a new sport. And as writers, we are hypercritical about our work. That I also, yeah. you mm-hmm. know, realize. And what can slow us down and also create this paralysis of creativity is mm-hmm. editing while you're writing. You mm-hmm. really have to force yourself to take that editor's hat off. Yep, so change and, your mind spaces. Mm-hmm. Right, and then here I am as an editor for Rain Magazine, mm-hmm. writing a book and editing myself as I'm writing, and that was painful. Like it was because mm-hmm. you're when you're writing something, maybe fiction or nonfiction, you're in this. You get into this natural flow, and that's yep. when you know you're just like, whoa! How I just turned out you know, 3,000 words, 10,000 words, or however many pages of content, where did that come from? Because you're in the flow. Mm-hmm. But when yep. you're editing, you're judging yourself. You're judging the work. You're you're criticizing, you know, for good or bad, you're criticizing maybe the grammar or the spelling or um, the tone, you know, how you structure the sentence. And mm-hmm. that kills the flow. Yep. And so if, as a writer, you know, for, for those that are listening, try to take that hat off. Try to, I won't even say try, do, do this. Take the hat off, go into your writing session, maybe for five minutes, three hours, whatever you set aside to write, and literally just type. You know, if you're using pen and paper, just continue to scribble. Don't look back. Don't, you know, like break that habit of going back to the last sentence or going back a paragraph ahead. Continue to write, 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 write until your hand hurts. Or you literally have <laughs> run out of words to put mm-hmm. on the paper. And don't even look at it at that immediate point. Just put it aside. Let some time go by and then come back to it. And then if you choose to edit at that moment in time or you choose to get accumulation of of ideas together before you start editing it, then go back and edit. And I would I would also advise maybe you not be the editor but hand it over to a friend or a group of friends that have agreed to be in a, a reader's group, which I re- recommend for anyone listening to this, if you're writing whatever project, fiction or nonfiction, create just a circle of people who agree to read your work and let them give you feedback before you start editing. And once you get that feedback, then you can kind of go and do your rough edit. But I think taking that editor's ha- hat off is so crucial to yeah. getting in the flow and staying in the flow as a writer. So that was something that I learned Um about myself as well that I, I thought was extremely beneficial because it took me about a year to write the first 30,000 words and it took me a week to write about 25,000 really? words. So, yeah. Yeah, I listen to, uh, I'm a huge fan of flow expert Stephen Kotler and where he got his start was actually, he was a journalist and then he's written several books and he just, he had me a journalist for extreme sports athletes and they were they they just because of their sports happened to flow naturally. Anyway, um, he actually recommends the exact same thing you do as far as writing, which is when you're writing, just write. Don't worry, don't don't worry about punctuation, grammar. It's like it's just get the ideas down on the page because that's that, that's that, like, that is totally the creative part of the brain, right? And then go back and edit it because that's totally the non-creative part of the brain. And so um, it's interesting because that's essentially exactly what you discovered as well. Um, along that journey. And so, uh, I think that's a super powerful p- point for, for anybody listening who's wanting to write, wanting to start that first book, you know, to, to just, to, to just let yourself go, let the ideas flow, um, get the information down there and then go back and do the painful part of, of editing and, and cutting and, and do not, because not only is it two different, two different sides of the brain that you're using, but by, by, by focusing on one, you allow that you you by focusing on one exclusively, you bring the best parts of that side of the brain to what you're doing at that time, and you'll do the best job of writing or the best job of editing if that's all you're focusing on. Um, because you know, fo- as he says, you know, flow follows focus. So um, I think that's super interesting that um, that's what you discovered as well. Um, 
But, yeah. yeah. I love drinking. No. Go ahead. Uh-huh. No, go ahead. No, go ahead before I ask the question. Okay. I was going to, go. as you were talking about flow, it made me think mm-hmm. of some techniques that I learned. And then it, the timing couldn't have been perfect. I was taking a grad course in mindfulness. And mm-hmm. one of the projects um, that I had to complete was learning to teach mindfulness. So I had to do this training course. And what I didn't realize before getting into the course or the many techniques that you can incorporate into your daily routine that yep. really increases flow, or I'm going to yep. say, or creativity is what I would say. And mm-hmm. and they're simple techniques. And yep. I wouldn't have been able to turn out 25,000 words if I didn't have those techniques at the time within such a short yep. amount of time. And yep. I, again, came in with the mindset of not to you know, pre-edit or edit myself as I was writing. So that was one thing. Two, I made sure that I did some creative activities prior to um, writing that section. And so um, when I say, or mindful activities, so maybe walking or running or um, there's something called uh, mindful eating for those of you that know that. And then you could do some, you know, yoga you know, and another activity that puts you into the zone. So doing some sort of mindful activity prior to writing actually increases flow. And then your surrounding environment also helps with that. So I had music playing very low in the background, certain music um, Mm -hmm. benefits flow more than others. I had candles, you know, scent, uh, you know, tapping into the things that you enjoy. So scents that I enjoy has candles around. And then I made sure my environment was comfortable and inspiring. So there were colors, there were textures. I love flowers. I had flowers around me. And these are things that enhance flow. So that was something that I learned as well, you know, that I didn't do prior when I first started the book. Mm -hmm. I wasn't really necessarily paying attention to my environment other than I needed a table, I needed my computer, and maybe I needed, you know, um, the space to be quiet. But beyond that, I wasn't doing any of the things that I did during that week where I really needed to crank it up a notch. So that was something else that I learned. That's interesting. I love that. Um, you, I I love the two answers you gave. One was, you know, essentially what the the technique, techniques you learned to increase flow. And the other one was, you know, what you learned about the creative and the writing process. I love both those answers. I think those are super valuable for the audience. Where I want you to go next is back to that question I asked you, but I want, what did you learn about yourself through the process? Like what, what, a personal revelation that you learned through, through this whole writing thing. I love poetry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we've discussed um, that. Yes. <laughs> the poetry and quotes, um, it was something that I was incorporating into my chapters without even realizing it. I opened each chapter with something new. And, and then when I look back, I'm like, where did that come from? Was that, was, was that me that, you know, wrote that? Mm-hmm. Um, so mm-hmm. I definitely tap back into that skill that I had ignored for so long. Um, or t- I would say more, more so took it for granted because I would write poems for myself, but I wouldn't mm-hmm. share it with anyone. Going back to that place of being vulnerable and, and feeling very raw. So I was, you know, able to be courageous enough to include, you know, some of my original works in there that made sense and was relevant to the topics at hand. So that was something I learned about myself. Um, I'm a faster writer than I thought. Yeah, Yeah, 25,000 words in a few days. Yeah, I would say so. um, I could write more than I thought I'd ever be able to write. Um, Mm -hmm. And I love the community of writers you know during this process Mm -hmm. i i was fortunate enough to attend a couple of writers conferences and take a number of workshops and classes and just i met the most incredible people that were so willing to support each other and help Mm -hmm. each other as if they've known each other for years or a lifetime and i've been 
to many a conferences and from marketing to entrepreneurship to fashion to business. And this community and this environment was so unique. And what it inspired me to do was to find ways to help other writers, you know, continue on their journey Um, as an offshoot to helping creative entrepreneurs. I just, I Mm -hmm. also appreciate so much more the power of the pen and how a word, one word can impact, you know, someone so powerfully, so Mm -hmm. positively and to find ways to encourage and empower and support other storytellers and other writers on their journey, having gone through it myself and understanding the challenges, you know, as a mother, as an entrepreneur, as a creative, and not only starting a book, but completing a book, not only completing a book, but publishing a book. And it's a process, and but it can be done, and you will feel so good when it is done. And I think <laughs> that if you have an idea that you want to turn into a book, maybe fiction or nonfiction, you know, I would love to help you. Like that, so for me, it's I'm empowered to help and support a new community that I wasn't really paying attention to before. So that's just, that's something else that I, I learned about myself. Yeah, it's, it's, it's two points. One is that ties really nicely to the value conversation we had with opening the show. It just shows how much, you know, giving values is a part of you, part of your core, part of, part of, you know, being a successful human and a successful business person as well. So um, I know that wasn't intentional, but it tied in very nicely. So well done. Um, the other thing that popped out to me was the, the power of the word, right? And how one, one word, I mean, it's crazy when you're writing, by changing one word, it completely changes how impactful a sentence may or may not be, right? Um, and, and, and I love that. I don't like writing. I, mean, I write all the time. It's not my favorite thing in the world to do. But I, I notice that when I'm, you know, in coaching calls, right? By, just by changing a few words, it's crazy how much uh, different the message is or how, how much uh, differently people receive the message. So I completely agree with that point that you make. So my question that relates to that is, obviously this book is more than one word, but what do you really want or hope people get out of reading Unleash Supernova? I want people to get out of reading Unleash Your Supernova the fact that where we are now, no matter what stage you are in in your life and how old you are, that you are just scratching the surface of your potential. Mm-hmm. And if we go to the literal definition of um, of supernova, it's a star, it's an exploding star. Mm-hmm. When it erupts, it becomes millions of times brighter than the sun. And so for anyone that decided to to play the stare off game with the sun, typically you lose. <laughs> mm-hmm, yeah. And um and so you could appreciate the brightness that the sun, you know, has and imagine a star being millions, not five times brighter, ten times brighter, mm-hmm. millions of times brighter. I relate that to the potential we all have within us. If we are currently the sun and we could erupt into that supernova. That's what we all have. That we all have that inner brilliance. We all have that magnitude of impact that we can make on um, in the world, on someone else's life and on our own lives. And so if they could take that away, even if they forget the five ahas and the mm-hmm. you know, the archetypes and you know, discovering your why and some of these other things we talk about uh, or that I talk about in the book, you know, having the right mindset and mindfulness and all these things. If they walk away remembering that they have the ability to become millions of times brighter, I should say, shine their light brighter than they are right now. And all they have to do is tap into that. It's already there. They, they don't have to buy it. They don't have to ask for it. It's given to each and every one of us. And we just have to decide that we want to unleash it, right? Like we have to decide mm-hmm. that we want to write the book. We have to decide that we want to create the podcast show. We have to decide that we want to sketch that design. We have to decide that we want to 
you know, build that house or create that garden, whatever it is. We have so much potential within us and we just have to decide to unleash it. That's really what it is. And, and the book gives tools and a roadmap on how to do that. I love that. I love that imagery too, because imagery is so powerful when it comes to, um, inspiration because it, 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 if you get the right image, it, it beautifully encapsulates an idea, an emotion, um, a, a movement, an action, whatever, right? whatever it may be, right? And, and, and that, that imagery of the supernova, right? That, like this, you're exploding with the potential. You're exploding with light and, 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 and uh, this untapped, un, and, and untapped, you know, ability, like I said, and that, that you can really unleash it, unleash this power that you're holding within and explode it out to, to create the life that you want to create, you know, start the business, you know, start the diet, um, you know, create the fit, whatever it may be, right? Like, I really, I love that imagery that comes with it. Um, because I mean, because it, again, with imagery, you can just inspire so many, uh, to do things. And, um, I, I love that. So it, it was well done on your part with that, with that imagery and, and that description. So, um, you know, We've done some, we've done some deep, you know, diving emotional conversation here. So let's, uh, let's lighten a little bit, kind of in the show on, on, a, on a light note. Give me your favorite story that you wrote about in the book that is a fun, uplifting, inspirational story. My favorite story. Oh, there's so many stories yeah. in there. Um, I know, but you got to pick your favorite, you know? I, I, oh, again, I ask the difficult questions on to, purpose. I have to pick my favorite. You do, yeah. Yeah, I'm the interviewer <laughs> and I write the rules. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I'm just going through, like, mentally, I'm going through these different experiences. And they were all so, um, each of them made an impact on me. And I, I feel that they're going to resonate with others as well. One of the things that I think, I, I still bring up and talk about today and I use a lot and I share with, with students that I mentor is to understand how important communication is. And we hear that word thrown around and what does that mm-hmm. even mean, right? You can communicate by yeah. writing, speaking yeah. and all those other things, you know, you communicate by dancing, you know, there's a lot of ways to communicate. Absolutely. And, but this specific story as it relates to communication, I think made such a difference in my life and it continues to, when I remember to use this is that share what you want to do with others and you will be surprised with who wants or, or who's yeah willing and ready to help you. And Mm -hmm. that means you might, you know, be putting yourself in a vulnerable place and you, yes, you may be judged and, and criticized or whatever it is that our, our heads, what we're saying to ourselves, you know, the self-talk, the negative self-talk that we um, sometimes play in our heads. Yeah. That, those things may happen, but on the flip side, what usually happens because what you want to do is coming from a very true and honest place. The person receiving that information then starts thinking and strategizing and, you know, all this stuff starts happening where they're like, oh, I know this person or I know this piece of knowledge or I can lead you here or I can direct you there. And then you get the next nugget that you need to further you on that path. And it takes a lot of courage, you know, because sometimes these are individuals you don't know that well. For some, it takes more courage sharing that with those that you do know very well, like family and friends, boyfriends, spouses, and that becomes the point of paralysis. But I think that if you're, whatever you're doing is coming, you know, from going back to value, from a a place where you're providing value and you're truly helping someone even if it's one person you know if it's it's bigger than you everyone likes Mm -hmm. to be a part of something that's bigger than them you know they want to be a part of you know an exciting idea or a new team or a movement you know 
people like to attach on to something that has passion behind it, you know, that has momentum behind it, that has drive behind it. And when you're sharing something that you want to do, it's usually conveying those feelings and that energy and who doesn't want to be a part of that. And so I, that's the story that I share in the book and in much more detail. But I think communication as it relates to being okay and being vulner- vulnerable around the things that you want to do and you believe in, even if it's, I want to create the first rocket that takes mankind to Mars, right? I mean, mm-hmm. it, that takes courage because most people are like, oh, yeah, right. How are you going to do this? These are all the ways you could fail, you know, blah, 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 blah. But that courage will also lead to the person that says, yeah, and I want to do that with you. And how can I help you? So I think that's just so important because I think that our own negative talk, self-talk and our own you know, self-judgment freezes us and keeps us in a point where we are never able to tap into that potential that I was mentioning earlier. It's so interesting because I've never thought about using uh, communication at, for inspiration. Uh, from the standpoint of that, you, you, typically you think of people like giving speeches and inspiring people like through inspirational speeches or whatever, but never, I've never looked at it from the standpoint of like using your communication, the information you're putting out there, whether it's written, whether it's, you know, an interview like this, um, as a source of inspiration, uh, gathering essentially is what you're talking about in many ways, you know, like, like it, you're, by putting it out there, you know, you get those contexts, you, you gather more information. Um, you know, I, one of the people I listen to says that, you know, ideas have to bump around each other and they, 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 they mate and they, and they, they form a new idea. And it's kind of the way it works. And, and it's kind of what you're tapping into with, it, with your, your communication, uh, uh, topic, which is, you know, by putting it out there, by allowing people to, to, to see it, evaluate it, um, you never know what may come from it from, from an opportunity standpoint. And I think that, it, I think I agree with you that that is super important to realize that um you know you never know what comes from putting an idea out there whether it's money whether it's uh you know whether it's contacts whether it's um you know whatever it may be right and and so uh I, that, that's super important for everybody to know whether they're entrepreneurs whether they're creative or whether they're just you know you know having a conversation with a friend right um like nothing happens unless you put it out there so i think that's i, I so, think that's a that, I love that story. Go ahead. Thank you. No, I was going to ask you, is there something yeah. that comes to mind that you can remember where you have to put yourself out there, you know, and, and sharing something that yeah, you know, could have been scary? Or, uh-huh. Yeah, so mine wasn't scary. The one, I have two, well, but the one that people are going to be surprised by is um, I speak, went back, you know, before COVID, I, I, I speak. And, um, I didn't want to speak for the longest time because the question I feared most was, you know, as somebody you can't see, as you know, I, I, I have this child, I know this child's in school who, you know, it has a disability of some sort and, and they're being bullied. How did you deal with being bullied? Right. And, and that was always a fear of mine because, and I, I don't know why this never happened, but I can honestly say I have never been bullied in my entire life as someone who couldn't see. Uh, everything that I ever got that might be considered, you know, bullying was something, I mean, I grew, I was a jock. I grew up in the locker room was something I deserved because I was being a smart ass or like, it, it was just guys bantering. Right. But I can honestly say I have never been bullied. And, and I, 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 my fear was, I don't know how to answer that. And, and that kind of became my answer, which was, you know, um, I, I, I've kind of, what I just told you, like, I can, I, I've never been bullied. I, I don't know why I haven't been bullied. Uh, so I, I can't answer that question because I don't want to like steer someone astray with, with a theory or, you know, conjecture, right? Because I, I never experienced that. And so I, that was kind of how I dealt with it was just by being honest. But that fear kept me from speaking for probably at least five years, uh, mm. if not more, because, because I did not want to give an inauthentic answer to, to me that was going to end up harming somebody else because it was built on a foundation of, of, of ignorance in, in my case. Right. So, um, that, that would be mine that pops off you know, t- top of mind for me. Mm. 
Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. And yeah, yeah, no, I think it is it's definitely something that in terms of sharing personal thoughts that may not necessarily, you know, be what the majority of people around you in that space may be thinking is, mm-hmm. is or experiencing is definitely uh, scary. And but if it's like you said, it's it's your truth, right? It's just it's right. And you're coming, you're being honest, and but at the same time, you're being sensitive to those that may not have that same experience. And you, like you said, you didn't want anything negative coming from that. And then it then it resulted into this, like you said, five year pause. So, right. yeah, that I could I I could definitely relate to that, and in in a different in a different way where you know we are afraid of revealing our I know our, our realist self, you know, we might be yeah. quirky. We might be, we, you know, I'm going to say quote unquote mm-hmm. weird or um, stupid or silly or whatever the words are that yep. kids use that adults keep with them, you know, when they think of, of being judged if the people in the room knew who they really were. And I think it's so much right. easier to hide nowadays with social media and with images and I was having a conversation um, yesterday with someone who mentioned that because we have social media and because people are just swiping, you know, you, you post yep. a new update and individuals swipe and swipe and, and they see that as replacing the actual relationship. Like they really truly feel that it's as if they're having a conversation with that person. And, but the person posting, whoever it is, is feeling more and more lonely they're still posting and everyone's living their best mm-hmm. life. But because that communication has been cut off, they're feeling really lonely. And so it even, it drives a bigger wedge from the opportunity of revealing your true self. Right. And so I just feel that it's a little more complicated now because of social media, but it's so oh, much absolutely. more important yeah. for the same reason, because we are having less, conversations with individuals that are really close to us to where we feel comfortable enough to show that side of ourselves. And then the more we show it, the more it becomes the bigger part of us. And then it's shown to those that don't know us that well. And I think that's the, the, the point is to get to uh, a, a place where going back to that inner supernova, that's a part of that real self, that weirdness, that quirkiness, that nerdiness, the whatever it is that's within you, that's part of that brilliance and being okay and sharing it. You know, that's your truth. So I love that story. Thanks for, for sharing that. And of course I'm gonna have to flip the table back at you to ask you uh uh-huh. in your in your lifetime that you could remember relating before and after to let's say a supernova event is there something that you can share where you're like oh that was a supernova event or that's what i unleashed my supernova um actually yeah it goes back to speaking and um you know the, the, when, I, when i first started speaking I, I did the typical you know like you get up there and you, you you, you relay your information, you give a serious speech and you inspire and it's all planned out and thought, and whatever. And, and it, it was fine. I mean, I, I, I think I, I did a good job. I conveyed the information I needed to convey, but, but w- that's not where my, you know, inner brilliance lies. Uh, because I get, I get a little stilted and, and my personality doesn't come through like it should. My energy doesn't come through like it should. And I, and I, I ironically enough, I don't tap into that flow. And so I kind of followed Gary Z's path on my, um, Second speech, it was eight, my second speech to the same audience because I did a year apart. Well, I did, you know, the first part was a speech just to kind of like, you know, let people know who I was and all that kind of stuff. And then I went into Q&A. And so like Q&A is, is where I shine because I'm giving true, authentic answers based on the question, based on what I know at that point in time in my life, based on what just, you know, like kind of popped in my head, right? And so like that's where my, like I tap into flow during q and a I, I, it, it's weird it, it, no that type in the flow but like my performance artist kind of comes out too like i'm more animated and i'm 
and, and my, my humor and my charm comes through that it doesn't when I'm giving a speech. And so it, 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 this information is the same that is being conveyed in many ways, but just by a slight switch and how I'm like the method in which it's being conveyed allowed that inner brilliance to shine. Right. And I think that's an important lesson for people to learn. Like, you know, just because something's not working the way that you want it to doesn't mean you have to scrap it completely. It may just take one little tweak and boom, that inner brilliance shines and like you have found what, like what, how to tap into whatever makes like your magic, right? Whatever makes you great at what you do. And, and so, um, yeah, that, that was pro- that's probably the easy example to, to pop up with as far as, um, that would allow my inner supernova to pop up, to, to, to shine. Yeah, no, I love that example. And I love the fact that you had shared that it's sometimes it's a matter of just tweaking one little thing, like not throwing everything out and walking away right. completely, but just changing the one little thing can make it a big difference in that supernova effect. And I'll have to say, I have to credit you to an idea that you had given me, which was I was looking, I was being given the advice to create YouTube videos and to, sh- because there's so much that happens on a weekly and daily basis in my world uh-huh. with the various brands that I manage. Um, you know, my team wanted me to like share that, you know, share, use YouTube, do TikTok, blah, 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 blah. And there was just resi- resistance. I was willing to do it. I'm like, okay, I'll do a video. But there was definitely resistance there. And I remember sharing that with you and you had mentioned or you had suggested, well, why don't you just write it in an email? You like to write. You're a good writer. And mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden it was like, like, <laughs> like the wave parted it's crazy, <laughs> like isn't it? yeah. the land. And I was like, oh, my gosh, that seems, you know, it was a, it was such a. It was so profound, even though it was a, you know, it was a simple suggestion, but it made all yeah. the difference because yeah. there was no resistance there. And it's the same information. Yeah. It's just yeah. a different medium and how it's being um, conveyed, but it made all the difference because yeah. I was more excited about it. I couldn't wait to write it down. And, you know, yeah. again, I love storytelling and I, I love doing storytelling through audio and I love doing it in written form. And as opposed to a staged video. It just didn't seem yep. as authentic for me. And so that one little thing thing made such a difference. So I want to thank you for that. But I of love course, the you're point welcome. that you brought well, up. And thanks around. for letting me know that. It's good to know. But, yeah, I yeah, know. It, it, so it, literally, a change in perspective changes mm-hmm. the world that you see. Like, it, it sounds so trite mm-hmm. until you experience it. But once you experience it, you're like, oh, my God. Like, I see the world completely differently now. Like, like how did I not see this before? Where was this world? Where was this beauty before? And it <laughs> right. really is that profound sometimes, right? But like, unless you've experienced it, it sounds like a trite thing to say. Yeah, but, so true. Well, I have to um, thank you for turning the table today and asking of course, me about fun. the writing process of Unleash Your Supernova. That was fun going through that. There was a couple challenging questions in there. And I had to be okay with peeling some of my own personal layers. Um, yep. So thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. I hope our listeners got something out of this as well. Again, take off that editor's hat. Just get there, get down, put pen to paper, and get into the flow. Everyone deserves to experience your inner brilliance. So remember that. As a writer, you are a superhero in your own right. Again, this show is brought to you by Pink Kangaroo. And that's Kangaroo with a U. It's a home for podcasters and podcast listeners that are wild thinkers. It was a pleasure, Ryan, as usual, doing another live show with Unleash Your Supernova. So I guess I will be bugging you about these uh, Bluetooth headphones between now and our next show. (laughs) But um, (laughs) I'm here to answer any questions you have. Bye, everyone. It was great, again, being with you for another Unleash Your Supernova. Until next time, this is Nova Lorraine, Ryan Anderson with Unleash Your Supernova Live. Have a good week, everyone.